concept of rurality is dependent to some degree on the passive and active relations between spa uh, places within spaces and how connected these locales are to others, especially in terms of movement flows. And we can think of here Geesley's paper that he gave earlier in the day uh, about that. <coughs> these connections, however, do not connect in a, a thin straight line say between points A and B, or say between a core of landscape and its periphery. It is our belief that in negotiating how these lines flow and what their intensities are, enables us to understand how rurality performs in practice. Considerably better than it does on this camera. <laughs> um, but this is part of it. So, uh, what doing uh, this sort of a performing uh, reality in practice does is help us understand how connections through the lines that connect with multiple places, rather than just defer to a kind of predefined rural, or use a line that represents the origins and the destinations of flow, this kind of straightening the line. What we have in mind, instead, brings, brings to mind Cleese taking a line for a walk. This is because, in our view, Lines that are rarely straight. What we're also interested in um, is in what happens when we attempt to think about this with an archaeological sensibility, excavating the layers of kind of reiteration and flow. And what this translates as in, in some form or other is, is what Matt Edgeworth has is, is presented as the articulation of what happens when, when we interrogate archaeology through the terms of flow applied, in this case, to lines. What we suggest is that how lines flow and bend is in a way to understand connectivity, intensities, and the emergence of a rurality. Not the coil, not the coil. Oh, okay. The coil. This, this is also part of it. The active paths do not connect in a straight line between points A and point B, say between different communities that could be defined on the one hand as core and on the other periphery. Although we find these terms problematic, they help us to think through flow. But we might alternatively use ideas associated with intensity. Instead, the lines flow as paths of movement in between so-called white spaces, uh, while, while negotiating the other nodal points that lie in between. A and B, and articulating these spaces in between as they become enfolded in the near-to-hand perception of the human world. There's something of kind of Mark Org's place and non-place in this. How these path lines, path lines are negotiated depends on several factors, such as the topographies involved, the, the other actors in it, human and non-human, but also the intentionality behind the mobility tasks. In fact, the, the idea of reality in a, in a locale is always dependent to some degree on the processes of, of active and passive connectivity and intensities that they have had and continue to have as they pulse in and through these articulated spaces. As a result, with our archaeological lens in place, examining how these path lines were negotiated leads to an understanding of the people and the other species that inhabited these extended communities as well as these kind of in-between in spaces. Thus, spaces that have no formal kind of infrastructural associations are often form, formed through other kinds of processes of making and negotiation. However, the irony is that the longer a path line was used, the straighter and more defined it become, became, turning an informal character into a formal one, and perhaps therefore transforming the character of, of a landscape's reality. Though we question where along that line the rural begins or ends. We can think about this in terms of the processes of production and consumption, as has already been kind of alluded to today through uh, Raymond Williams. The uneven surfaces of a landscape further confounds the straight line. These straight, straight lines are a contrivance of the surveyor's mark. Take Gunter's chain, the theodolite, the differential GPS. And Barbara Bender once remarked that landscapes refuse to be disciplined. Equally, the same refusal applies to lines that connect. They too refuse to be disciplined. Even when the destination is clear at hand, 
and with the intended potential and virtual straight path ahead, it is rarely straight in practice. Topography, the thawing and freezing of rivers and bogs, the accumulation of snow, the seasonal forces and the resistance of some material remains make a mockery of any attempt to traverse the straight lines across the landscape. And as these, line, as these path lines are rarely straight, equally, they, they rarely have the same intensities. That's a piece of wood, by the way. That's a piece of wood. Imagine the, the grains of the wood. So one of the factors associated with flowing lines is that they are continually articulated through repeated and reiterative movements. In this respect, we would like to revisit Byron and Coleridge's idea of circumcision. Circumcision? <laughs> Circumcursion. <laughs> Circumcursion. <laughs> Though not necessarily movements performed for, for pleasure. <laughs> And to use this line, uh, to use this as a way to articulate the significance of habit and inscribe memory in helping to shape an emergent understanding of reality. Another factor we're interested in is that the uneven surface, like this piece of wood, present topographic opportunities and challenges for the path line. For example, surfaces disrupt and bring effects onto the passage of moving through a landscape and therefore disrupt connectivity and intensity. They bring with them transformative power and redefining the line shape, and where the line's direction is already curved rather than, than straight. We also allude to a dynamic sense of reality here, that the space is open to change and rearticulation at various temporal scales associated with the seasonal or longer-term durations of use. Also, the line that connects spaces together has a tendency, as a, as a result of these surface negotiations, to, um, to become fragmented, broken, because the transverse surfaces alongside other influencing factors were varied, sometimes physically different, sometimes altered through the embodied relationship that, sev that multiple species have with the surrounding landscape, such as changes maybe in mental state, in, in the rhythms of moving bodies and their, and their breathing, and the form of the moving assemblage. This creates non-contiguous lines with different intensities and potentials. So just as the wood grain is also part of a tree's biography, a root toolbox of sorts, so too are the landscape's lifeways, <coughs> acting through path lines across the landscape as they become ingrained into the very materiality of its form. Now we do a little swap. Mm -hmm. I can't play the last one. We began by arguing that in reading the lines connecting people and things in the landscape, we are able to understand and read the rural itself. Let's consider an example. And this is an example I mentioned earlier, so uh, apologize to those who are listening. Earlier. Uh, The lawman, Sura Björsson, controlled a number of farms in the north of the country of Iceland in the early 18th century, including on the shores of Hutafjörður, a small property called Mirur uh, in the north of Iceland. Uh, those living on the farm paid rent to Sigurdur every year, and in a society with hardly any money, this involved moving materials, often live sheep, from the tenant farm to the owner, in this case, Sigurdur's <coughs> farm in the south of the country. These goods and sheep that were part of the subsistence package, wait, let's see, these are goods and sheep that were a part of the subsistence package and they were often self-contained, inscribing habitual movements into the paths that connected the farms within single communities. As we stated earlier, however, the line between A and B is rarely straight and doesn't even always go from A to B. In this case, the tenant is instructed to leave the animals that defined the amount covering the rent in one of three possible farms, depending on circumstance, roughly halfway between the owner's farm and his property, approximately two to three days' travel with the animals. Uh, the historical sources also mention that the tenant sometimes brought the animals to the yearly National Assembly, an even longer distance, 
and probably one that he wouldn't have taken uh, without the, the insistence of the, of the owner to, to send rent there. In turn, one can imagine the animals taking a second journey of a similar duration and, an, and ending up at Seura's farm. The connection between A, Seura's farm in the south, and B, his property in the north, is hence articulated as a pair of lines. The first originates in the north, the other in the south, and they then converge on and encircle intermediate spaces of interaction. The three possible destinations for the drop off of sheep, as well as the National Assembly. The line taken for a walk, so to speak, tied together the farm in the north and the farm in the south through a community of farms in the middle. <coughs> so let's expand on the notion of what a rural is here as, a, as an entanglement of lines. The lines of rent payment are seasonal, negotiated yearly. We can co contrast seasonal lines to other forms of line, the everyday line, journeys to the buyer, into the fields, and to church constitute what Ingle termed the taskscape, landscapes formed by habitual movement and action. Everyday lines are the ligaments that form communities, but communities are never fully insular and cannot rely only on its so-called strong ties, these everyday lines. Occasionally, seasonal lines are vital in tying communities together, in negotiating regional interaction and trade, and in our eyes, helping to define what the rural is. In joining disparate communities located in different parts of the region together, they're formed, they form new cohesive holes that emerge out of the active entanglement of connecting lines, some, street, some strong, others weak. Here is a rural that changes its rural form when places become connected and decoupled along lines of movement. Granovetter famous, famously refers to these as weak ties and notes that the formation of social networks depends, in a sense, on the strength of weak ties. <coughs> Communal grazing sheep in the summer offers another example of this. Sheep were brought to commonly used upland pastures, and in the autumn were brought back down to be sorted at sorting folds. The collection called for communal expeditions, but also calls for a multi-species assemblage of humans and animals who cooperate with each other in covering the landscape. Searching for wandering sheep, as well as negotiating and reaffirming community boundaries, and finally returning the sheep to their respective communities. Rurality is dependent on how connected it is, not in terms of its isolation, but rather the kinds of lines that make connections. A community may have strongly linked nodes or farms, in our case study, but it might, might also have, but it also has the strength of weak ties between these clusters, particularly concerning the movement of human things across the seasons. In fact, negotiation of these lines and these connections enacts the rural as if a tidal ebb and flow. The rural is not oriented around a single central core nor is it even a definable permanent thing in our eyes before it is found. Instead, the rural is characterized by two things. First, how distributed and connected its communities are and how susceptible it is to alter its form, perhaps through the interruption of day-to-day -day movements surrounded by habitual tasks. The effect, rather than the definition of what it is through intensities and flows of movement that circulate and repeat within a community and beyond. This is a dynamic and emergent rural. At the same time, no community is completely isolated. Occasional visitors bringing news, trade, disease, and ill intentions <coughs> pierce the isolation and fold rural communities into the wider landscape. Isolated, subsistent rural communi communities become dynamically linked through episodic and rhythmic connections and intensities through their weak ties and the paths along which taxes are paid or the seasonal forests into the upland pastures of animals where mixing and dynamic action takes place. Understanding the rural in our eyes is tied with the entanglements between places along these lines, the curve and bend to the conditions of the path that the, that the hand and the feet takes on the lino and the landscape. And this is dependent on at least three vectors of the line's constituent features. The repetition of use, the maintenance or decoupling of these intensities of use and duration, and the kinds of intentional connections in their use. The fluctuation and rhythm and the fluctuation and rhythmic properties of these vectors 
is one of the emergent characteristics of our landscapes, whether edge lands, inside, outside, core periphery, urban, urban, or rural. We're done. Thanks. Do you want to talk about the practice? Yeah, we can, yeah, we decided to talk a little bit about the, the practice and uh, we, we started working together with a sort of a third, uh, with a third voice in our, in our minds because we thought uh, in preparing a, a paper, we, we thought it would be too easy to, to throw up a PowerPoint and to have a sort of very fluid mediation between us. Instead, we, we wanted to get our hands dirty, literally. And, uh, and so we've, doing, we've been doing this a couple of times, and uh, what we hope to achieve by this sort of performative nature of, of, of the paper is to, uh, to give some kind of ad additional ways into our thoughts. Uh, we view the analog prints as a creative practice and as a kind of third voice. We hope that it brings out aspects of our thought as immediate, risky, and above all creative, that also helps reveal something of the gaps that lie in between the assumed definition of rural. 